Welcome, Felix, uh, Mr. Felix Pages. Again, it's yes, the color and translucency on tooth form and crown form. Yes. You're well, thank you to... very much. Uh, the first time that I wrote a paper on this was in 1984, believe it or not, after the symposium, the first ceramic symposium in London. I had to speak there and I decided to write this paper and then quintessence corrected so much stuff on there that i told them you're not going to touch my paper and you're not going to change my words and i withdrew the thing so screw them <laughs> anyhow let's look at some objects and you have to learn what you're looking at when you're seeing an object so if you have two objects that are identical in size physically that doesn't mean that they're going to look the same optically. This is the case when uh, you have the quote unquote, the stackers and grinders in a lab where somebody can just stack porcelain and then another person shapes it with discs and stones and everything else. And some people could shape perfect, but depending on the material and the background, uh, the framework, it it would look horrible, like metal ceramic is pure reflection. And the more metal you have, the taller the metal is and the wider it is, you can shape all day long, I don't care how good you are, and it'll never look the same size as the tooth because the the light transmission is different. So you have to learn to see what's going on with some of these objects. The, the best... Uh, color and scatter and refractive index is actually found in plastics and the reason for that is is that the particle sizes of the glass fillers don't have to change you don't heat it up and melt it and all this that's why that's why some some people say well you can't fire the porcelain that many times blah 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 because you're basically eliminating the glass and you're forming more of a crystal phase and that's where you don't have the uh, expansion right anymore and you get cracking simply because you've baked it so many times. That's called de-vitrification. So you're de-glassing it. So natural teeth follow this rule as well. So when you have very soft translucent teeth, like older people, like me, I'm 71 now. And when I see my teeth, I have to say, do I have any teeth in there? because they've gotten darker or more translucent as you get older. My granddaughter that's eight and she smiles, man, and she fills up the whole room because the prisms are scattering a bunch of light. So lighter shade, younger teeth will always appear bigger than older, more translucent teeth, even though physically they measure the same. And that's something that you have to really learn when you're looking at your at at the teeth so to match a natural tooth you really have to to choose the right material that will allow a certain amount of light transmission and then there's some things that you can do designing substructures or if it's an all glass crown etc cetera, etc cetera, uh, there's a lot to be done so the more opaque a material is the larger it will look because it reflects more light and so when you do these zirconia frameworks that that look like a a German tank, uh, those are not going to allow any light to go through. I don't care how good of a ceramist, quote unquote, uh, you are. You're not getting light through the proximals and the incisal ledge. There's the voodoo thing that it's going to chip, and so you're really limited as to uh, how you design this. So the thinner you are, the more the framework has to look like the final shade in the metal ceramic the thinner you are the more the opaque has to look like the final shade so a modification that needs need to be made and i'll show you a few things that you can do to amplify the size and width of an object and reduce it so when we look at anything uh you're looking at a local color so when you paint a picture, the artist paints this and he does this color next to this one, like a Bob Ross, that guy's fantastic. He can take a, he can take a roller and paint a pine tree. I mean, you know, so 
some people have that talent and you, can, you usually see pretty good color. There's not that many color blind people, but the local color is the color you put on something and the, then you have color vibration, which means the light waves mix. The further you are, the more they mix. And then you get the optical color. So here you see purple mountain majesty. I mean, where where is the purple in the mountains? You know that that song. <laughs> if you go up there, there's no purple. It's it's all the colors that are mixed together. By by the time you see it from a distance, the color changes with the light temperature and everything else. So just you have to be able to control the local color. That is the stains, the porcelain that you put on your crowns to create the optical color that you want the viewer to receive. So if the target is your shade guide, you have to sit, sort of really know what a shade guide is, is, how it's layered, how thick it is, et cetera, et cetera. And at some point, if somebody can leave a comment as to what is a micro layer, because I talk to hundreds of people and everybody gives me a different thickness. So you're doing like these big zirconia cases and they'll say, yeah, I'm going to micro layer this thing. I said, okay, well, and how much porcelain are you putting on it? I'm not sure right now. Well, first of all, even porcelain thickness is a fairy tale because the tooth doesn't have it. The tooth preparation doesn't have it. And it must be written in some dental book that you need even porcelain thickness. I want someone to explain that to me when they prep the teeth the front teeth you can eat an apple through a tennis racket and they want you to bring it in and make it look good and so the proximals have more porcelain than the facial does and so you can't have this even porcelain thickness so you have to learn to compensate for thick and thin areas in the crown which is basically think of it as push and pull so you're reflecting light and trying to slow the light down and pulling it in so not only uh, is the the light optics important but what about the material itself so any monolithic material that is not a multi-layer material has a very low chance of matching a single tooth and of course you know right now the popular thing is to do all on four all on six or all on eight or on on 16 <laughs> whatever many implants these guys put in there but the choices are very simple you either you either get something that tries to mimic a natural tooth or you don't. And so when you start to look at whoever made this chart, I, I tip my hat to them. You can see this uh, ref reflection of light and color through different light sources. So if you look at the very bottom, that's a light behind the work. And you can see all the way to the right. That's VM13 with a metal coping on it. So there's there's no way that the light's going to get through. And I see so many videos on the internet about building this porcelain up and building that porcelain up. And you have a prep that barely goes up half of a central and with a little tiny framework. And then they're throwing all this porcelain on it. That's very risky. I don't care who you are. And then they can put all the, the kitchen sink in that crown and do whatever where the reality is you have minimal reduction facially, and you may have a little bit more proximally, so you have to learn to deal with that. So when you have the second row from the bottom, you can see the effect of ultraviolet light on some of these products. This would be called quote unquote fluorescence, but that's just a small part of fluorescence. What, what people fail to understand is very few people go into these nightclubs with black lights, um especially when you get when you get older and the fluorescents are produced in natural teeth by cells called fluorospores that are mainly in the dentine and the cementum of the tooth there's hardly any in the enamel and what happens is they absorb ultraviolet radiation and they store it and under a certain wavelength of light they look this blue white color but that's, that's the least of the things. If you walk into a nightclub with some green teeth, I'm sorry, but you know, that's gonna happen, but that's rare. What the real thing is, is when you pick a material that does not have any kind of fluorescing effect in it, when a patient gets a crown done in the dental office under whatever light they choose in there, and then they ask the patient to go outside 
thinking that this is the holy grail of perfect light, which is really the worst, because the light temperature changes from morning to, to night. And so depending on, on what time of the day and your geographical position on the planet, you have very few uh, hours of what I would call photograph, they call it photographic daylight. And the fluorospores increase the luminosity of the teeth. They make the teeth look more brilliant when they go outside in the sunlight, but crowns that do not have this uh, any fluorescent properties. They don't do that and they look gray outside. So typically the failure of a lot of the pressable materials and zirconia full contour that do not have fluorescing materials in it is that they're gonna go gray under, under uh, fluorescent light. But the key thing is, is to increase the luminance of the crown when you go outside, not when you go into a nightclub. I haven't been in a nightclub, I don't even know how long, but anyway. So the materials react to light. So you need to, to get a specific UV light of 365 nanometers. And that is what produces the, the, the best uh, ultraviolet response in natural teeth. And you can buy one at Amazon for like 30 bucks. Don't get the ones at the tire shops. I mean, at the uh, auto shop where they sell you these little UV lights. Those are 395 nanometers, which Basically, it's almost visible light, which starts at 400 nanometers, and those are good to check leaks in your air conditioning, but it does nothing with uh, making the teeth appear bl bluish or whatever you want. So the ones that look to me and still is setting the standard are the Vita blocks. I mean, those things are so nice, especially you know, the Trilux blocks, sometimes they'll say, oh, I can see the line of demarcation. But, you know, you can, I always use those for the most difficult cases. And then I layer a little bit of uh, porcelain on it, VM9. People fail to understand that a Vita block, once it's bonded, it's really, really strong. My daughter has one in her mouth for over 20, 20 something years. And I'm about to redo it because she's she's got some, uh, bruxing problems due to her father <laughs> and so i'm going to redo the teeth after she's getting some ortho treatment and so that material bonded is incredible and it reacts to light absolutely beautiful and they melt at 1200 celsius 1200 celsius so you can put put it like a potato on a stick and glaze it add porcelain nothing happens nothing warps no margins nothing no movement zero whereas in some of the pressable ceramics you have to really be careful and fill the whole thing up with with uh i don't know some type of a dye you know i don't i, I never remember the name stay put or whatever those things are called so the margins don't deform and if you have a thin wall facial or lingual it can also cave in if you go too high. So you really have to go super low on those things. That's, I think the glazing temperature, uh, if you use a low fusing glaze, they need, they need to be down around 720 for the extremely thin crowns and 740 for average crowns that may be a half a millimeter, or I mean 0 0.6, 0 0.7. They'll glaze nice without warping at 740. So let's look at this. So the width and the height of a prep has a massive influence on the chroma value and translucency of a crown. This is a beautiful ASC abutment from Nobel BioCare, which is very, uh, I, I don't care about, I don't care that much for them and I don't, they don't bother me either. However, they will not, nobody can mill it mill it in the lab it has to be milled by nobel if not they cancel the warranty on everything implant a little tie base and everything else so you have to you have to go through them because they have a very specific uh tripod you put a screw in there it expands and i don't know why they haven't broken because they're putting the the margin in tension but we've done hundreds of these things and not they they haven't broken the only one that broke are two canines when you have 
uh, the a natural abutment behind it, which would be a, a first buy that's moving a little bit, and then the uh, canine gets the whole hit, and they those have broken. Besides that, they've performed beautifully on even on like second molars. I mean, it's incredible. But if you look, the width of the zirconia, just like if you mill a, a framework and you go wall to wall with zirconia, there's no way the light can get through there the right way. So you have the optical width, which would be the black lines. I mean, the, the, the physical width. And then the blue width, the blue lines are what you want your line angles to be at. And then they taper way back. And so if you don't use a softer enamel proximally or a softer dentine, uh, you're going to have a crown that appears larger than its natural counterpart next to it, the neighbor. It just won't work. And of course, nesting is critical when you're doing regular zirconia. You can't mill these in your lab. I mean, you could try, but it's... Uh, most doctors are going to want the real deal. And so that is the problem is what are you, what are you, uh, if you're going to do a full contour, one of these, good luck because they're not translucent enough there. It's a three Y type of material and uh, it's not very translucent. That's the problem. So you have to kind of choose your poison. Any material has an order has orders of translucency so if you look at this and i think this is from a vita light cure uh resin i thought it was a very nice graphic so you can see that the thicker you are the more chroma you get and this is what happens with some of the zirconias when you do a full contour zirconia for a certain shade uh you can't have everything the same thickness and if it's uh if if you don't nest it the right way and you don't uh I mean, it's a very difficult thing to match to match any of these zirconias to a natural tooth by itself. That's why people do all on four, all on sixes, all on eights, whatever, because they you can you don't have to match anything. So the smaller the work gets, the more difficult the color match is. And of course, you have to see how this material reacts to thickness. This is why I've always Jim and I always talk about that every porcelain company needs to have a certain percentage of translucency for the dentine or base dentine or opaque dentine, whatever you want to call it, uh, at a certain thickness, like one millimeter. And I think Dr. Giordano is going to, he's on the ISO board, and I'm trying to get him to bring that up and see if they can just print it, because I can do it by eyeball when I'm, when I'm building crowns, because I still build up porcelain. And then I can control things with more or less translucency, more or less opacity to create the form that I want by using chroma and value to help me influence the shape. When you ask an artist to paint a picture on a, on a flat canvas or a wall, they have to use contrast, light, dark contrast. So if you're, if you're gonna do the, a molar on an occlusal surface, the fossa areas are all a little bit warmer and as you go up to the cusp tips, they get a bit lighter. The problem with nature is, is that a lot of these cusps are more translucent. And if you don't have room or you use an, uh, uh, too much opacious dentine or your core material, the zirconia you use, if you don't nest it right, you have the fossa area that's actually higher in value than the cusp tips, and you get an optical inversion and you lose the depth in the crown. So whenever you want to create a deeper looking crown, you have to fake it with light, dark contrast. Low lying areas are warmer, higher areas, mountains and valleys, the mountains have to have snow on them. Now, this is a nice little chart from the Lumax material. And you can see they have a, the, on the left, you can see a comparison of, uh, Opacious dentine from the VM series, like VM9, VM7, VM13, where they have base dentine, transfer dentine, et cetera. And on the bottom, you see Lumex AC. So the opaque dentine is actually a little bit more opaque than the base dentine in VM9. Let's just say if you're going to build these two on zirconia 
and you decided to use too much opacious dentine from Lumex, it would increase the reflection. So you might want to mix opaque dentin and dentin together 50-50. That's one thing you can do with a 3D system is that you can create any translucency you want. And that's what I do. So if you have a few teeth that are slightly different in thicknesses, you can control. Let's say you had a lateral that had a half a millimeter of porcelain to put on it and the central had a millimeter. You could build the lateral up in in let's say base dentine in the central you could use half opaque and half dentine so that the reflection would even out if you want them all to look similar you can you can do that and of course here's the rest of the lumex kit and you can see where each individual category of material falls into a opacity translucency line and I must say this, that the clear on the Lumex is as clear as I've ever seen in my life. It's much more translucent or transparent than the window material ever thought of me. And so in, in a few cases, once I know I've nailed it and I need to put a little clear on it, I can, I'll just put a little Lumex on top of a, a VM9, it's the same expansion. And so that works for me, you just have to try it. So when Claude Siever was developing the VM series, we did a whole bunch of crowns and we tried everything. And so you can see here that what we were trying to do is we were trying to get the base dentine not to be so opaque. And that if you had a half a millimeter of base dentine, it would look like a millimeter of dentin. And you can see this in the middle tooth where you can see the root part on the left to your screen you can see it's almost the same color as the dentine on the bottom right of that big tooth so you have thicker dentine it'll be more chromatic you have thinner opacious dentine or base dentine it'll be less chromatic so chroma is controlled by the thickness of the crown okay so rarely will there be crowns of equal thickness so controlling translucency is very important and the nice thing about the 3D system, which I still prefer, is that you can create any translucency you want. So if I see base dentine 50-50 and translucent, and then I glaze it, finish it out, these are quick little tabs that I made, nothing, you know, could, they could, there could be better tabs, but, but some companies don't wanna make tabs. So I do them myself. And so you see the same thickness, this is a millimeter. You can see the difference of the transpidentine, the 50-50 and the base. So this way you have to, re you can control it. You can't do that with the classic shades because each shade has a different hue value and chroma. You can just control the chroma, just control the value and just control the hue with the 3D and you can also control the translucency. So in order of translucency of present day restorative materials from the most opaque to the most translucent, you would have three wise zirconia at the bottom. That's the most opaque. Those are the original zirconia that were considered framework zirconias, where you had to put porcelain on it. And when they started out, they wouldn't even use a bonding layer and they were wondering why it was falling off and Ridiculous. Then you have the 4Y, you have 5Y, and now you're up to 6Y. And, you know, there's a, there's others that maybe even more, but the, the more yttria, which is what the Y stands for, when you put more yttria in the zirconia, what it does is it restructures the crystal in layer, and you create, you grow more large crystals. When you grow large crystals, it allows more light to go through and less scatter. That's why they're more translucent. So if you can think of zirconia as like a jigsaw puzzle, the 3Y would be like a million piece jigsaw puzzle. The 4Y would be, I don't know, pick a number. And so as you get to the 6Y and the 5Y in some parts of the crown, or if the whole entire system is 5Y or 6Y, you have much larger crystalline structures. 
which allow the light to pass through. Then if you layer anything with uh, VM9 or whatever porcelain you're using or Lumex, you can uh, change the refractive index of the zirconia. And I'll get into that in a second. Then the next thing would be the glass ceramic, which would be, uh, di uh, what do you call it? Uh, Emax, Ambria, and Suprinity. The Suprinity is lithium silicate. The other two are lithium disilicate. It's uh, the size of the uh, crystal is a little smaller in the Suprinity, but it only comes in really limited shades. And uh, you have to wet mill it. And so most people, are shying away from that i told them i said i have to wait till the patient comes in with that shade and so oh, i can do a suprinity on that that doesn't work that way in the lab you got to have everything whatever the doctor writes on that script then they remember the old empress which is a lucite reinforced glass which is which is what what uh, lumex is lumex gets its strength being the strongest of the lower fusing porcelains because it has lucite crystals. And so it's a lucite ceramic, which causes beautiful light scatter. So you can remember the Empress crowns were a lot prettier than Emacs or Empress II, let's just say. And of course, uh, the strength matters, but the Empress was much nicer looking in aesthetics. And then some shades of the Vita blocks, depending on if you go to more chromatic colors, they are less translucent. And then the felspathic veneer with clear or enamel, depending on, on who's making the veneer. I have seen Geller make uh, what he calls taco shells. <laughs> he gets uh, either a refractory model or foil, and then he just puts clear or enamel on it to close diastomas and stuff like that. You gotta have a doctor who knows what they're doing, but you know, the closer you get to clear, the, 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 the less opaque it is. So given two objects of equal physical dimension, the more opaque one will appear much larger. That's the basic rule. So I also take shades of the tissue, but what you have to do, I don't care whose tissue porcelain you use, you need to mix it with clear if you have a clear that's really good because they basically have to make it could you could have endless combinations of this so what i did is i took the most popular denture resins and uh, i asked a couple of labs okay make me a denture with this or give me a little chunk of this that's left over or whatever and then what i do is i did this here and i also have one where i can i can take it to the patient's mouth this is photographic paper and i just glue it on there and you can see that i mix everything 50 50. and so the 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 critical thing with tissue porcelain to create the illusion and depth and reduce the reflection is to mix it with clear and when you mix it on your glass slab it's like the old denture festooning days where you have like the papilla and you mix all your colors to characterize a denture base. I don't mix everything really well. I'll have the pure one, I'll have 50, 50, 75, 25, and I may have two or three colors together. Like I enjoy using 233 and 234 quite a bit. And if you look, you can see on the card on the left, you see where it says G4 with VM9, that, color is probably as good as it gets but it's high fusing and so i've done a lot of big zirconia cases with vm9 and then we do the papilla with the uh, low fusing lumex and it works beautiful and so you see when the, when you have real papilla and real real tissue the bone isn't so far behind, and that's what the 231 is on the left, where it says pale papilla. That actually I use sometimes to, when you have some cancer patients or you have some real thin bone, I can create the illusion of tissue over bone, and it really looks looks natural. And so remember to mix it with trans with translucent or clear. And then when you mix it on the slab, don't mix it so perfect. If you mix 50-50 and just mix the hell out of it, 
it ain't going to look real. So you have to make splotchy parts. You have clear, and I don't mix it very well at all. It's easier that way. You just throw that crap on there and then pick up a little chunk and put it here and there. And by the time you fire it, you have real natural looking tissue. So you see right there, I have quite a few different of those shades. And then at the end, I characterize with, you see the bottom, I use the bone. You see, this is a cancer patient. And then you see the little pink lines. And then after this, I'll pumice it so that it, the surface of the teeth look, look better. And so the whole idea is to use light, dark contrast. You see the interproximals? And then I take a, a burr and I flatten out the tissue right by the gingival of the tooth. So if you ever look at some real teeth and how the gum finishes up, it's almost like you could take a number five chisel. That's a, an instrument used to clean up a shoulder porcelain in the mouth. I mean, a shoulder prep. That's what it looks like. And so once you see that in the mouth, it's hard, it's hard to tell when it's in there. So here's the bakes, light, dark contrast. Sometimes I flow a little stain with water in between the tooth and the gum. And you can see that it looks contoured already, but this is fairly flat. That whole outside is flat. But what you're seeing is you're seeing a very light color. Can you guys see my mouse by any chance? The pointer? But anyway, there's a light, there's a dark, light, dark, light, dark, light, dark. And that's what gives you a three-dimensional look. So the strongest of the papilla colors would be right there in the inner dental. As soon as you get over on top of the tooth, you need to use clear with a lighter color. That would reproduce the free gingiva. Felix? Yes. Yeah, no, no uh, at least I, I can't see your cursor, so just Okay. To... Okay. So, but anyway, that's what you have to do. You have to place a, a light, medium, and dark chromas and slightly different translucencies next to each other, and that optically shapes the tissue to make it more real. This is after it comes out of the bake. Obviously, you can see it's still a little rough there. Same thing here. And so with that, I clean up the proximals a little bit and then polish up. And that's basically how I, how I designed some of the work and how I use the tissue porcelain. If you just use one shade, one translucency, it looks like chewing gum for most of, most of these things. So you have to really do that. And then you can use your stains, the dark pink and light pink and mix the two together. So you have three pinks. And then you can put a little violet, a little, excuse me, a little dark blue and make a, a soft little violet color, which is very present in the, um, in the, what do you call it? The veins, the little, what's the miniature veins called? Varicose, <laughs> very close veins, uh, capillaries. And you can see sometimes they're a little bluish. So you can go to town on this and have fun if, if you're getting paid for it. The experts at Zircon Zahn are the ones that introduced us to coloring teeth in the pre-centered zirconia, which is what all we could do before to match the, to match the teeth. The translucency and chroma can be controlled much easier when you do this. And I still, to this day, when I see the work that some of these guys that Enrico Steger brought on board, it, they're just stunning the work. I mean, there's no other word for it. And they deserve all the credit because they really, I call them avatar teeth. I think they're beautiful. Like that, it's just that it's hard to take care of and things have evolved so much that we're getting better. But this is, this is uh, the most accurate way to reproduce teeth when they're full contour zirconia. If you get these colors right in the aquarelle and what all the other stuff, and you cover, coat that with a little bit of clear, it, it looks like a crown that's been layered. And so uh, that's basically it. So you have, you have to be careful with how you place the colors next to each other to create contrast. And you can see what they did here. I mean, it's a lot of work. And so that's the same, uh, the same uh, guide use that we have. And so that's the aquarelle pre towel and, and they really did a nice job doing that. 
Tell me that doesn't look like an Avatar movie. So, how about this one? Let's look at some common problems that affect aesthetics. Well, that certainly is one of them. <laughs> so you have bad preps, too much or too little reduction, poor tissue management, ortho corrections with crowns, poor shade management, monolithic color restorations, wrong restorative material selection, lack of material knowledge, and lack of technical training. Do what you want, say what you want, but you still have people that are kinetic perceptive that need to take a course. You can be auditory perceptive like me, and I can listen to something and probably repeat it pretty close. And then there's the visual perceptive, which obviously everyone has a little combination, but you have to know the materials. You have to know how the light affects these colors and how the preps are. And the thing you have to do is you have to learn to say no to the doctor. I don't know what they did with this case. This was on the internet. And I said, man, I said, this is that guy. If he smokes, he would have a cigarette holder. But anyhow, that's just pathetic somebody needs to lose their license so let's look at some targets and then some solutions to common problems remember whenever you sit down to do a case you sort of have to know your target and if the doctor switches up and changes his mind in the middle of the thing it's like hold on a second doc no 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 you got to tell me right from the beginning and especially some patients will say oh i like this color and then you do the and say, no, I didn't mean that color. I want this color. So you really need to make that very clear to the dentist that he can do, do it in his treatment planning. And everybody gets nailed. I don't care who you are. You're going to get nailed because the, the patients will start whining and everything else. So you got to make them happy. Let's look at some teeth, natural teeth. So when you see the more translucent the tooth is, if you look at the lateral, this is Alwyn. Alwyn, is that Alwyn? No, that's not Alwyn. I can't remember who that is. I'll show you Alwyn's teeth in a minute. But this particular patient, I took all these in a photo course in New York to show them how to take information shots. I don't care about a full arch with retractors and all that stuff. And it's almost like the doctor goes into, into embryo position whenever he has to take a photo. They have to put the retractors and, and, you know, go all the way back to the ears. And it does, it shows too many teeth and you see nothing. How can you see the facial of a premolar and a molar when you're taking the picture from the front? I'm, I just don't understand. It's a waste of time. So if I'm trying to match something, I need to take three to four teeth at a time and that's it. No more. So if you look at the lateral, the lateral has a, is much thinner tooth. Therefore, it allows more light to go through typically and that means it's a little bit lower in value so when you're trying to do a natural setup the reason that lateral appears that it's back back in the arch a little bit more and it looks grayer it's because it's thinner and the canine next to it has a much bolder look and so you have opacity translucency contrast between all the units. So what type of contrasts can you think of? You have intra-arch contrast, you have canine, and the, the, the central incisor and the first bicuspid are always the same shade. Rarely are they not. The lateral is a little bit grayer and the canine has more chroma, and it's usually a little bit more yellow. But if you do everything with a, with a monolithic puck, even a, um, what do you call it, uh, a layered puck, but it's all the same shade, you're going to be dependent on some type of stain in order to make them look natural. But most people want them chalk white, which is ridiculous in my book, but anybody can do those. So when you start to look at this, you have to look at the obvious. When you look at this, what does your eye see first and what do you focus on? What does, what does your eye get drawn to immediately? It could be one or more things for different people. What I see 
I look at the incisal edge and look at the chips in there, and I look at the little little blue things that are there. That's from the freestanding enamel with no dentine behind it, and it's causing this light play. Then you can see that the proximal areas are a lot softer. They're blue-ish. That's because in the natural tooth, you have freestanding enamel in the interproximals. If you have worn teeth, they look the same shape from top to bottom because you've wiped out some of those incisal effects, etc. So when you look at the occlusion of a patient, you have to think of the angle of eminentia in the glenoid fossa. So if you have a bulldog jaw like mine, I'll wear all my teeth flat. If you have somebody that opens and closes, those teeth are going to age naturally, and there will hardly be anywhere. You can have a 50, 60-year-old person with beautiful lobes. They're not mammalons. They're, they're, uh, those are just the inside of the tooth are developmental lobes. And the outside are just little enamel pearls that they usually wear away. So let's look at the next slide. I take and I do either black and white photography or I desaturate it so that I can see the light and dark zones of the teeth. Now immediately you can see that in the proximals, you see how much lower value it is. And look at the highlight of the flash. You can see the line angles of this patient's tooth. So the further something is out, the light's going to hit it first. And then you have it fading back to the proximals, and then you see a much softer, grayer, quote unquote, under black and white photography. Look at the lower incisors. They are definitely, you can see the reflective area is from where that gray stops, starts in the interproximal and goes towards the center of the tooth. So when you're viewing lower incisors, they are a triangle within a triangle. And most people make them way too flat and the interproximals are so tight from the facial that they look terrible. They produce a shadow. What you have to do is you have to create a 45 degree angle from the line angle that you can see the reflection on the centrals. As it goes way back towards the tongue, way back, you have to open that up. The light goes in there, it reduces the shadowing and it allows the light to push out the color inside the teeth. And so I deliberately produce this black and white photography to increase the contrast zone so that I know where the push and pull of the light is. And it helps me do some buildups for some, you know, difficult, more difficult cases. So when you see this, I highlight these line angles. Now, if you look on either one of the centrals, you're going to see a warmer color from that red lines. On the distal of both centrals, you're going to see a much lower value, which almost looks like a light, like a brownish dentine shade. And then you can see the physical width of the tooth, which is what it measures. But the optical width is the highlights. And so if you don't get those right, the tooth is going to appear bigger. So you have to have slightly higher value in some little pieces inside, which everybody calls mammalons or developmental lobes, and they're more opaque, just a little bit, than the covering. So if you're doing zirconia, I always do a dentine bake first. I take a diamond, I shape up a little bit, put the mammalons on there, fire it, and then I cover, and it's a lot easier than playing hero and trying to do all that. So you have to think of high value, low value, is contrast, which equals opacity and translucency. So there's different types. Now you can also see that there's always a soft blue color in the corners of the central incisors, and sometimes in the incisal edges and in the mesial. And anytime you see this beautiful blue, this is unbacked enamel. Unbacked enamel has the particles, the, the calcium, hydroxyapatite in the enamel rod. So you can think of them as a clear uh, straw filled with table salt. Those scatter light and they produce shortwave radiation. 
which is blue light, which is the same reason the sky is blue. It's known as Rayleigh scattering. And so it's an optical illusion. If you put your finger behind it, you can't see anything. So think of the physical width of an object and the optical width, physical length and optical length. Here's Alvin. So look at this. This guy has really got some colors in there. And in this case, he has a lateral that is less chromatic than the obviously the canine and that one central's got to go because he's got a mess in there he's gonna have to get that one pulled but you can see the premolar with the blue the lateral with a little bluish then you see a creamy halo so if you're building up the same color that you use for the cervical the neck of the tooth or the denting if you salt and pepper that around the incisal edge you put the blue first and then you put that to create a contrast and that you can shape the tooth by putting the creamy halo wherever you want it like this one here see this tooth is much wider so when i did that crown i reduced the reflection on the distal part of that crown to make it appear narrower there's no way to close that space and still have these things look look normal that's uh i don't know you can't win them all but i want you to notice the secondary dentine on the lateral incisor on the patient's right hand side you see how it has a bony look to it so what happens is if that tooth is traumatized a little bit you can see that it's out further than the other lateral that's because the, the canine and the and the and the lateral incisor are banging into that and when it keeps banging into it the tooth says you know what i have to deposit secondary dentine if not my pulp hurts and that's why you see this bony looking stuff that's secondary dentine and then you almost have a line in the middle of the tooth where you see this this beautiful translucent enamel it's that picture is a lot more uh contrasty than the other lateral on the other side which is much smoother that's because it's not in malocclusion like number seven is so you have to think of every little thing of why these teeth are changing color same thing here see i hope that tissue heals up there on the right slide because that thing is that was a hard crown to make and so you see all of these areas here you see the prep if that doctor would have left the prep a lot longer than this, there's no way that I could create this translucent effect in the number, number, what is it? It would be number nine. And so you can see clearly the, the translucency in the uh, distal proximal of the central. And most of those, when you look at those, it's because the lower tooth is banging on it. And then, of course, you can see the resin filling on that other lateral. But the trick is, is to get those line angles right. And I wish that doctor would prep just a little bit subgingibly, but it's pretty close. Same thing that we did. So if you do Lumex at 0.7 A1 and 0.7 A3, the more chromatic is less translucent so you have to think about that too so some of these beautiful light shades that you can see right through them if they're thin common sense the longer the prep the less the incisal translucency the wider the framework the greater the optical width the taller the framework the less the translucency the thinner the veneering material the more the framework has to match the final shade and monolithic materials can, can be challenging. Layering porcelain gives you the most control in creating shape with color and contrast. So many colors and translucencies in the porcelain bottles. You can get anything you want. There's too many of them. Stain colors are limited. I don't understand why they have some of these colors like canary yellow, and I don't get it. They need to have something that looks more like tooth colors. And all of these have fixed translucency and opacity with stain colors. You can't really mix the stains to make them more translucent or less translucent unless you mix them with glaze. 
to make them more translucent or mix them with white to make them more opaque. And of course, the problem is the possibility of the stains, if your staining zirconia all day long, it will dissolve over time. Glidewell and uh, Dr. Gordon Christensen did that study. And the less space is required with, with quote unquote stains, I like to call, her, call them colors. If you tell a patient, I'm gonna go stain your crown, they, they start looking at you funny. But if you put, I'm gonna go color your crowns, that's okay. So what you have to do is you have to see what your enamels look like. Like for instance, the Lumex, I like to use the smoky white. If you use Lumex, it's a slightly lighter enamel so that I can use that on a line angle to create the illusion of direction by using a lighter line angle on one line, one line angle of a central and a lower value enamel, let's say mesial or distal, and it'll actually cause a, a tilt because the white's reflecting light, the gray is absorbing light, and you do that. So I fire the tabs, I measure them, I sort of know what everything looks like. So in the VM9, VM13 and all that, you can see the enamels are light, the enamel light. On the Lumex, it's just a little bit darker. And so I use the smoky white, on the Lumex, which makes it look like the others. Is that the same slide? Yeah. So, I'll alternate light and dark enamels and dentings to draw attention to an area or de-emphasize an area. The facial width will appear tilted facially or lingually depending on high and low enamel values. So if you have a straight line like that and you want the tooth to the mesial line angle, let's say of the central, you might use a slightly higher value enamel on the mesial and a lower one on the distal. And then that'll cause an optical tilt, even though physically they're, they're flat. And the same thing the other way. You can have high and low, and that'll cause it. So if you, if you have a doctor hell-bent on making the teeth straight like ortho or a type of knot model, they can look at it and say, oh, yeah, they're straight. But you can fake it and make them look like a little white on a distal line angle and a little gray on the lateral, and it'll give it much more contour. So the whole idea is controlling the value of a certain area to create the optical shape that you want the viewer to see. Like this arch right here, I just wash the stains in with water, this brown stain, and then I brush it off, I'll show you later. And then I use a little light, dark contrast, nothing fancy. I don't know what I'm gonna do about the holes. But I told them, don't criticize the porcelain if you're willing to have a hole like that on your, in your molar. <laughs> I can't fix that. So here's another one. Here you can see in these lower in anteriors where I used a uh, color inside. And then I put little bits and pieces here. Then on the glaze, I'll put a little bit on the outside. And I call that referencing. For instance, if you have a, an aquarium and you have fish swimming inside and that glass is so clean that you don't know where the glass is, you can't appreciate the depth of the fish or the aquarium or the beauty of it. So if you were to take a little plastic, little, little sticker fish and put it on the surface of your aquarium, the glass, everything else, the light would hit that surface fish first and it would make everything else look really deep. And that's a real help to create three dimensions. So you use a lower value, like a soft blue enamel inside, and then on the facial, you put little creamy or white little streaks, and it, it, it makes a three-dimensional look immediately with hardly any space whatsoever. And here it is with uh, tissue. You can see the see low value, high value. And that way you can make this, you see the interproximals, how they're open. That way the light can get in there, a little bit more chroma on the canines. And so when you do stuff like that and reference the surface, you see the lower value inside, like a warm orange, a little blue, and then you have little streaks on the surface, which is the cream color stain. I can't remember the name of it. I, I wish they would just use numbers. 
instead of these fancy names like mango and all this other crap. I don't know what that is. I want I want numbers. So you see this, this is a provisional made out of a PMMA. And I don't have the picture, but what I did is I took the light cure uh, stains, which are supposed to look exactly like the accent stains, and they're pretty close. And what I did is I characterized a provisional, and then I duplicated it in the porcelain. This is a very difficult patient. She has hyperpigmentation on some of these. She's about 80 years old, nicest person in the world. And then we try to match that central. That's not easy. So the prep is decent and it's super gingival. So, and here was the old crown that she came in with. And this is what I made. And I, it looks, looks a little light at the neck. That's it. But I can't do any better than that. I saw her one time and I shipped the crown, which I hardly ever do. But I wasn't there during cementation. But you can see still this orange, and then you see little little white creaky lines. You can put those on the outside. And then, of course, the width on this one was favorable. It wasn't bad. This one's a little narrower, which you would have to do an overlap to get them to be the same size. But Big improvement of what she came in with. Not perfect, but close enough. So the same thing here with the tissue, porcelain, those teeth. You have to use light, dark contrast. And then you can see what we did here. So the whole idea is to create three dimensions, you have to use color. More Sometimes more important than the shape. And here's a, that's another cancer patient. Here you can see the matrix that we did. And I was able to, I guess I missed a little corner there. And then you can see here the lingual of these. These are full zirconia and layered on the facial. And the lingual, there's nothing. And so I used a much warmer stain in the fossa. I tried to carve it out, but it's pretty flat. And there you have light, dark contrast. So the proximals of the teeth have have white and the uh, fossa are much darker and it fakes the eye you think it's a real fossa in there but it's flat as a board that's what it looks like in the mouth and these implants are already outside the mouth so you can see the tissue light dark contrast see the capillaries i mean it's pretty close so sometimes a patient comes in and uh, you want to do the right shade and they say, no, 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 I want this. So this was uh, YZST2M1 with Lumex on top. And that's what they wanted. And I mean, I'm like, God, I said, but what are you going to do about the rest of them? She goes, I'll get those done when I get the money, <laughs> which is fine. But I've done a lot of very light crowns uh, one arch is white the other one is age uh, appropriate the other one is not age appropriate but you can see still here the open interproximals the halo contrasting the, the translucency just put a little cream on the edge you can see that look how nice the, lat the centrals look compared to this lateral which i couldn't put too much translucency in because the preps are really long on this number number uh, 10. So I said let me see which stain I can use and I use white and gray and so then I can create the I can create the color for each shade because they're not going to make all these all these stains. They have chroma stains which are good but you got to mix them a little bit to get the right shot so the idea is finding out what stains are translucent and what stains are opaque so if you take if you take a regular shade guide and you put in just a little dot of a stain on top and you can see it like a sore thumb it's more opaque than glass but if you can barely see it that means you're close to the match that's how i learned to do some of this it was a body shop where i had a i had bought a car and I didn't have it a week, and a lady at a parking lot opened the door and bashed my brand new English car. <laughs> and 
and I took it to the shop and this guy that looked like Willie Nelson sprayed four or five greens on the door. And he said, you see this one right here? I can't see where I sprayed it. That's, that's the match. I said, brilliant. And I said, I can do that with my teeth. And so sometimes when I have a real bear of a central, I'll take my colors with me and then I'll touch the facial uh, wherever I see the stain right next to it. And that way I can, I, that's what I'll use inside the crown. So here you can see some of the colors that are, that are, I use the ones with the red star and the blue star. The rest of them, I don't, I don't know where to use them. And you take a photograph, black and white, and you can see the value of the colors. And so you can see some of these stains in the, in the kit are very close. And if you take a black and white, you can see if the value is the same. And that way you get a better idea of what you need to color a shade. Here are the chroma stains for the 3D and they all look orange to me. So I painted them on each one in group four, whatever they called for. And I, I just thought they're all too orange. And then you take the, you take a black and white photo and you can see they're pretty close value wise but the hue's wrong. So it needs to be a little, little more, uh, I don't know, greenish gray. So hues can exist in many values. This is a, this is a Sonera technology display mate. So when you have a computer and you wanna see how many real colors you can see in different values, you should be able to see 16 or more for a normal, normal screen. And you can see, at the very top, the white to black, okay? Mid-tone gray. And it's the same thing with hues. So you can have orange, yellow, green, whatever, but they can exist in different values. So you have white and black, and in the middle you have neutral tone gray. That's how you should think of your stains and your colors that you use. Some are higher value, some are lower value. So no one's made a, a value-based stain, stain kit. So, in the posterior teeth, I made the simple diagram here. If you want the crowns to really look deep, you have to have more translucent cuss tips and a light absorbing area in the fossa. So if you have a slightly warmer shade, it's like when I nest some of the molars, I try to get the I try to get the fossa area, the bottom of the fossa from the margin to the bottom of the fossa. Uh, darker and then I'll put the rest in the enamel whatever whatever puck I may be using or or Schuyler at Pro Lab will do it because I'm 71 years old and I have friends with boats and friends with scanners let's see so the whole idea is to make the cuss tips a little more reflective and the fossa more absorbing and that way it gives you depth. If you have it the other way around, you're going to lose the uh, loss of optical depth and the crown will look like it's flat or inside out. And this is how I stain. I'll take a crown like this. I'll take the old brown stain, which is called Fumo 3. You can get them at eBay and any old stain kit from the Accent stain. I mix it with water and I just push it all over the place and with water and it'll sink to the low spots and then I take a brush and I keep brushing away until I get what I want because that's how natural teeth stain they don't look like I-95 and I-10 they don't so you have to make little high spots and low spots and throw it in there and they look a lot more natural and you can barely see it in the mouth because it's shadowed you can see the color stronger in the mouth that's why zirconia looks too bright when you put it in the mouth but it looks okay on your model because of the refraction. Now, some fixes are impossible. So these are two Lisi and, and uh, Ambria side by side, and you can see this prep, you can see right through that, and that would be very difficult to try to color and stain, so you just have to leave it be. If it was more reasonable, even though this surface is flat, you can paint it and create the illusion of, of a, a fossa. So here you can see the plain crown 
warmer color. And then the next one, I, I put a little white. Obviously, you have to exaggerate it for, for uh, your lecture. But you can see light, dark contrast. And it literally looks like, like it's caving in now. And the same thing with this. You can put a little white here and there and change the line angles like this one. So you see these two crowns were nested different. And then I put this white accent white plus with glaze and I paint it on here and it starts to look like like the enamel on that zirconia. And I left the middle alone so you can see the difference in the color. So if you want to accentuate a line angle white, de-accentuate lower value like a blue or violet. See, they look pretty good with a little bit of the white mixed with glaze. And accidents will continue to happen. This was a student at Brown University and I, she did a face plant on the sidewalk and she came to us and uh, she had a very difficult situation. The tooth didn't die. Well, what you're gonna have after the prep is you're gonna have a tremendous length where what do you do there you have to layer it you can't use a solid material we decided to do uh i think we did a vita block with vm9 on top so what happened is during the preparation her teeth would dehydrate immediately and so what we did is we did a clear tray with ringer solution and glycerine and by Every time we were gonna prep the teeth or touch it, we would stop and we'd put that tray in there to keep the tooth from dehydrating. So what happens is the patient comes in that has a quick dehydration, it'll take 24 to 48 hours to get the color back. Then the problem is, what are you gonna do? You're gonna match those white streaks because those will be gone. And then your crown's the only one that has the white streaks. So just do a suck down tray and ringer solution is artificial saliva. And so you can put that in there with a little glycerin to keep the air from touching the surface of those teeth. This was done by George Blanco. He's a Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry and really one of the best preppers I've ever seen in my life and tissue management. And he does all these really difficult centrals. He calls me for that. Somebody else gets, gets the other stuff. <laughs> So what I do on some cases, I draw myself a little on my glass slab. I don't like wet trays. And I put the colors what I, that I'm going to use inside those that picture. And then I take a little Ceric block and the leftovers from the crown. I flatten them out and then I stain it. And then I try to see how close I can get. And you see that yellow on the bottom left. I'm trying to take the internal color for this particular patient where you can see the, the lobes inside. And then I have the same color that I did over here on the right. So that one blended pretty good. And that's how I take my shades. Then I take that with me and build the crown up. And so you see, we started here and you can see how close the crown is, but it was missing the blue. So we had to go in and grind this away and I use the blue opal and I got a pretty good result on this particular patient. And let me back up here because I think I have this one. I might have missed uh I might have missed putting one slide in there. Yeah I did. Oh well it was a before and after but anyway that's how I do some of these with a the light dark contrast and using dentines mixed with clear which to lower the value just a little bit if you use the 3d system you can do 1 m1 1.5 m1 0.5 m1 i don't care what it is it, you can you have full control that's the beauty of that 3d system people don't appreciate it enough now one day when they get the colors perfect on zirconia we'll be able to use the body i do a lot of like cutbacks on just the incisal like half of the tooth 
and I do a full contour zirconia and I just do a very thin enamel layer and that works out really well too. I don't have enough of them documented yet to uh, to show you, but it's it's difficult. It's more difficult than than just doing the layers. Well, thank you very much, and uh, I'll turn it over to Jim. Any questions? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Felix. It was very interesting. A lot of good information that we can use in a practical manner at the lab. Yeah, a lot of uh, food for thought, I believe. Uh, we do have uh, several questions, uh, but before I get into them, just a couple reminders. Those of you that are inquiring about CE, we'll, we will use your registration information and get those letters and or uh, information to you on the CE, whether it's uh, uh, CDT information for uh, MVC or um, uh, what are the brokers, CE brokers, uh, et cetera. And we'll, we have also videotaped this webinar. So give us a couple of days. We will post it on the Vita North America YouTube channel. You can go back and visit and listen to some of, of the information that you may have missed. And then, of course, you can always get a hold of uh, Felix uh, as needed. And then also uh, here at the help desk. And then as far as questions go, uh, let's start. Um, do, do you routine, reach, routinely check uh, the fluorescence of your uh, finished crown? And if you do, with what kind of a light source or what type of light? I actually, have, a, I actually have a tube, like a, like a three-foot uh, fluorescent, I mean a UV tube, black light tube, underneath my workspace. So I didn't get into the liners or the uh, the power wash today. But what I do is once I'm coating for a bonding layer, my zirconia, before I even fire it, I just put a hemostat or the model underneath my desk and the black light is on. And I can see if I missed a spot, believe it or not, it'll look white. And then I make sure I have a nice even, even coat somewhere, except for the incisal area. So sometimes I will do the fluorescence. In, na in nature, it's way deep inside the tooth. So if you have a monolithic material that, that's too fluorescent, it'll show up too strong. So you can't have, let's just say, an Emax with too much fluorescence because it's at the surface. And it'll appear much stronger than it really is. So any of those lithium silicates or glass ceramics, you've got to make sure they don't put too much of that stuff on there. But in nature, it's really deep. So we do a bonding layer with power wash from Lumex or the liners from VM9 or the Fluo Intense from, uh, from the uh, Lumex also. They're highly fluorescent. You use that as a bonding layer, and then I do a buildup. And they, they come out beautiful. And the whole trick is, is that they will the crown will light up like the tooth does when you go outside, because the fluorospores in the tooth are not present in the crown, and that's the that's the beauty of it. So you can you can control that. Is it going to be perfect every time? No. Do I take a shade with a UV light? Yes, I do. I make sure if that patient has a really strong response to a UV light, then I'll put a little bit, you know, heavier coat or whatever. If I hardly see it, I hardly put it on there. And it, that's a hard hard thing to predict because you, you can't check it every two seconds unless you do it while the patient is there. And that's just a practical impossibility. All right. Thank you. Um, what are your thoughts on the new translucent zirconia blocks, which new is kind of um, relative, right? Because we're, we're, the industry is coming out with new zirconia blocks all the time. Are they any good? Any suggestions to improve their quality and aesthetics? When you say blocks, you're meaning like uh, like a, the size of like a, a Vita block or a puck? Probably either discs, really more of the zirconia, the newer uh, zirconia yeah. as we reach higher and higher in. Uh, yeah, what happens is what happens is if you could have a puck, let's just say that you're using a, uh, a four-wise zirconia, like an ST. 
you if you go higher in temperature like the, the firing temperature on that is like 1530 i believe so let's say you went up to 1560 or or 1570 if you go too high on some of these things depending on the constitution of that zirconia because uh, a lot of a lot of manufacturers are making like the cervical part would be a three wide zirconia for strength a four Y transition layer and then a five Y or even a six Y for the incisal part for real translucency. So the proof is in the nesting. You have to really know, like for instance, the Nacera pearl, which we carry, what's, what I really like about that stuff is that they have the nesting. You have your, uh, let's just say that you had an 18 millimeter puck. You can see where the transition is in millimeters and you can nest your crown up and down and their their sale sales pitch from the doceran people that that produce the first naceros are uh that you can nest two shades you can create two beta shades just from one puck so if you had an a1 and an a2 you could lift up the a1 so it would be closer to the top part of the puck the occlusal part where the writing is and then the neck part and body would go down into the, the 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 more chromatic part you see what i mean so you could have an a1 up higher in the same puck and an a2 lower in the same puck it's just how you nest it and of yeah. course you gotta make sure your furnace is in any zirconia if that they're firing correctly if not you're not you're not going to produce the translucency in a nutshell what happens is typical zirconia particle sizes are about 0.2 microns so the reason they call it a double refractive material it's double refractive and uh what happens is is the the grains are so tiny that they push the light and the grain boundaries are so tiny nothing can get through and so you have refraction from the particle and refraction from the grain boundary and that's why the material looks very high in value in the mouth. And so by increasing the yttria, you're, produ you're making the particles grow larger. Basically a million piece jigsaw puzzle to 100,000 to 10,000. And so what happens is, what happens is, is that as the crystals get bigger, they get weaker, but they let more light through. And there you have to be careful. Like, for instance, when you have these fancy uh, three, four, and five wiser zirconias, the most important consideration is where the hell are you going to put the connector? You better put the connector on the bridge in the strongest part of the zirconia. And if your reconstruction happens to be like a seesaw, I mean like a roller coaster, where you may have a very high area then you have a you know an implant way low and all this and you're trying to make a thing like this you could have connectors in the weakest part of the zirconia the 5y or 4 to 5y transition and that that's that's going to break so so there's a lot of positives aesthetic wise but there's a lot of negatives structurally wise so you have to be careful with some of these discs and make sure that your connectors go in the right place so I like them. I like them. I mean, there's some, and I think the most difficult thing is, is that you don't really know who the heck is making these things. There's so many on the market. You say to yourself, well, wait a minute, this looks like a lot like this one, but I'm not sure it's that, you know, like dense fly little, little blocks and things like that. Those could be made by Vita or who, or Ivoclar, who knows who makes them, but you can always find out, I guess, but, the labs are dealing more with pucks, unless you're doing glass ceramics like Emacs CAD or Supernity, that type of stuff. And then, you know, or, or the Haas, any of those you have to wet mill. And there's, you know, it's either dry or wet mill. I don't like these combo units. You're asking for trouble unless they're super expensive. Next. Hard, hard to switch between them, clean them up and so oh. forth. Yeah. Uh, why do some of the zirconia copings get uh, lighter after firing? That just happened well, to me, least, actually. 
<laughs> in their experience, yeah. What happens is is that the the pucks are colored with metal oxides, just like uh, you know you paint them on. And so I had a meeting with the Upsara Zirconia people five or six years ago in Tampa at, at Pedro's office in Americana Dental. And they had two ceramic engineers there and Pedro asked me to come up and we sat with them and the lady who was the ceramic engineer that knew very little English had a translator who was a marketing guy. And she handed me this little bag of coal, like charcoal. And I was going to say something smart aleck, like, did I do something bad this year? And you brought me coal. <laughs> and she asked me if I knew what that was. And I said, absolutely. I know what it is. And they looked at each other like if I was from Mars. And I said, no, I'm from Neptune. But what happens is, is when you put carbon, when they do their zirconia, and they color it, and you fire porcelain on it, if the porcelain that you use is higher fusing, like 900, 940, like Noritake can go way up there with vacuum, a lot of times those colorants in the puck itself they go away, they get lighter. I have, I took pictures and I sent them to everybody and it's just a fact of life. And so what happens is when you're layering, if, I, if I'm just doing facial layering uh, with uh, zirconia occlusion, my occlusion started to lighten up. And so then uh, they said, put the carbon in, in there when you fire it and it produces a, a, re, a reducing atmosphere it was CO2, which doesn't oxidize away the color. So all of those colorants, they reach a certain temperature and they burn out little by little. And conversely, if you have a coping that comes out too dark for some reason, you can run it up to do uh, like a thousand degrees for 15, 20 minutes, slow cool it, and it'll, it'll burn off some of the oxides and it'll actually get lighter before you, you know, put porcelain on it or whatever. But that, that's a very good question. And I spoke to Dr. Bob Kelly and Dr. Giordano, and I made them aware of it. And they they invent the stuff and they do it, but they, they don't see it in the lab. And I sent them the pictures and Bob Kelly retired and he never got back to me. But I know that that's what's happening in speaking with other people. So some of the metal oxides that they put in there to color it, they're like chlor chloride salts. They can burn out. And that's why a lot of times you can't put fluorescing agents or anything like that in the zirconia because during the thinner process, it burns out some of the color. So so what you're seeing after sintering, it may it it is a it is a combination of a planned color that's supposed to come out, but it may be overcolored during the puck making procedure to accommodate oxidation of those colors. So by the time it comes out, you're, you're going to be close to your shape. Now, since you have different thicknesses, uh, that's very difficult to control. So, you know, that's, that's the whole key, but yeah, that's why they get lighter because the elevated temperatures will burn off the oxide. Even if you have a porcelain, like I use Lumex mainly, on zirconia because it only fires to like 750 celsius but you have to be aware that if you have a big molar pontic next to uh, a crown that's hollow it will take forever for that pontic to heat up and cool down compared to that crown and so what you have to do is you have to make sure that you slow cool that thing a lot and you're going to have to raise the firing temperature just a little bit because let's just say you're going to paint glaze on a on a big molar uh pontic it won't glaze at the same temperature if you go too fast because the the amount of zirconia you have to fire zirconia by the mass not the shape so that if you have a gigantic molar it takes forever to heat up and forever to cool down a crown next to it that's hollow, it'll cool and heat up a lot faster. And of course, you don't want to fast cool it because that'll put strain on the connector and that'll cause failure later on. So you have to go the slow road 
go go 25 to 30 degrees a minute real slow and you have to go up in temperature on the pond if you use lt glaze from vita i go to and i use lumex i go to 770 and i leave it there for a minute and that's it but the warm-up time to go from 400 to 770 could be 10 minutes that's the nature of the beast you have to make sure that, that you have to think of the different mass and the heat capacity of the pontic next to a crown that's hollowed out next to it so that's that's the reality of the situation you have to think of that and and glaze accordingly you can't glaze a low fusing porcelain higher if i have a zirconia okay. itself and i'm staining and glazing i'll go to like 850 somewhere in there i try to stay away from 900 and below the oxide colors inside the zirconia shouldn't suffer if you go above 900 you can you can burn out some more color in the frame all right uh last question it's kind of a two-parter so um what is your the thickness of your gingiva uh and then also do you have uh, a favorite gingiva color which I like, relative I like the g4 g4 and the vm9 mixed with clear 50 50 or or window whatever on the vm9 and on the lumex i like 233 234 right in there mixed with uh mixed with clear 50 50 75 25 so the most important thing is get the clear if you get the kit the kit comes with glazing liquid for i don't know why and and with glaze and some people have mixed the glaze with the tissue porcelain you don't want to do that get the lumex low fusing i mean uh, the, the modeling liquid from lumex and you should use that for your for your tissue porcelain, because if you use a regular Vita liquid or any other liquid, there's stuff in there that won't burn out at a low temperature, and it's not going to look good. So that that liquid was made made specifically for low fusing porcelain, like Lumex, VM15, VM18. Uh, that that's that's what it's for, and it, it makes the porcelain handle very nice. So that that's a word for, word from the uh, from the whys and the and the problems that I had, <laughs> and so you can't you can't use any liquid with that low fusing material. So you got to use the the Lumex AC liquid. All right, Pour thank you. If okay. uh, if anybody if anybody wants to get a hold of you or wants to look at some of your articles that you mentioned, um, is that possible? Yeah, what they yeah just sent you have the phone just send me a text and say hey I'm so and so you got a minute or whatever and I'll be more than happy to do it. All right. I saw a couple of you guys that are friends of mine. I saw Mike Morris was on there from Lexington. Hi, Mikey. And then uh, Richard. I saw him on there. So let's see. I hope to see you at the convention. Not sure if I'm going yet. Anyway, thank you very much. Yeah, any any last comments or words of wisdom from you before we uh, let everyone go? Like uh, Chico Escuela used to do on Saturday Night Live. He would say, keep your eye on the ball. <laughs> All right. No words well, of wisdom. Just uh, look, the, the, the main thing that I've, I beg people to do is to learn their materials. You need to fire tabs. You need to know what this stuff is going to look like in different thicknesses. You need to fire your stains. I've got, I've got crowns that I milled out in zirconia and I put every stain possible on top of those crowns, like three or four at a time on the facial of the central. And I ran them up 740, 750, 760, 770, you know, like that. And I couldn't get any shine on them at below, like at 740. And the pink ones, I couldn't get a shine until 760. And so that's really interesting that you have. So I always mix a little bit of the LT glaze with some of the stains if I want to create, you know, something like Mio, which everybody's 
thinks is great. It's just little low fusing glaze mixed with your mixed with your regular stains. And you can make a really nice, you know, delivery system. So that's a, that's the key. And make sure you don't over fire. I mean, I have a big combination case I'm working on now that has some Emacs lower anteriors. Don't ask me why. And the rest of the case is zirconia, layered and full contour. And I have to bl blend all this so it all looks the same. <laughs> that's the tough part. So yeah, it's due tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. So <laughs> it's the life of a technician. Yeah. All right. So yeah, we'll thank you, you very much. Yeah, thank you, Felix, uh, for really uh, well, offering your time and educating my, everybody. My pleasure. Uh, right. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, and again, visit us on the uh, the Vita North America YouTube channel, and you can revisit Felix. And this will conclude today's uh, Vita Academy webinar. Thank you again, Felix. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye, everyone.